Hi, I'm Dakota, and you're listening to the Better Ideas Podcast. got another great episode for you guys today. This one is going to be with the drummer from a band called the Dear Misses. His name is Brett Collins, and uh, he's a cool guy that you should definitely check out and keep up on, and so is his band. And this is just an awesome conversation. One of the things that I'm really glad about is uh, I'm getting a little bit better at figuring out how much to rely on notes and pre-planned questions and how much to let the conversation flow and just happen organically. So you guys have definitely heard a variety on this show where sometimes I have a whole list of things that I really just want to ask. And, you know, so it feels a little bit more like an interview, less of a conversation or, you know, say the guest isn't a huge talker or, you know, you just kind of have to get the ball rolling. So it's good to have those backup questions and all that. And on this one, I wasn't sure, you know, we, I hadn't ever met Brett before he decided to come over and do a podcast. So I went ahead and I had some things planned, but the conversation happened so organically and we were still able to get to all of the questions that I wanted to ask. So it's, it's a great conversation. It, it was such a blast to meet Brett and to hang out with him and to learn about the history of the Dear Misses and how he got into music. And so we talk about a little bit of everything. You know, we start out with how he got into music, how I got into music, and how our stories kind of relate and overlap, and some of his musical influences, such as different bands and artists. And uh, we even get a little bit philosophical later on and just kind of talk about what music is. Like, it's such an ambiguous thing that we all kind of take for granted sometimes. So it was really cool to unpack that. It was a really fun conversation. Brett, thank you for coming and being a guest on the Better Ideas podcast. I really hope to see you again. And uh, I feel like I should shout out their next show. Uh, the Dear Misses will be playing on August 24th at the Granada. I'm going to be there, so you guys should definitely check that out. This band is awesome. They're kind of like alternative rock. Um, they have a lot of different rock influences, though, you can tell. And it's, it's, it's just good music, and I highly recommend it. So I hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Okay, yeah, no, I totally remember that now. And so you guys were on that one. Yeah, we were on that one. And we were too, right? These were Does the it not say better ideas on that one? Mm-mm. Man, I wonder what show maybe that was wasn't now. It. Maybe we didn't maybe we didn't play a show together. I just I try to remember every band that I we play with. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think we have. Dude, I know that I've played with Aviator and Commoner on a show. Yeah, because so that was... Uh, I just couldn't imagine it wasn't. Well, because the lead singer of Commoner, he's now the lead singer of Zion, right? Josh or whatever? Yeah. Is that... Yeah. Is he? Yeah, he moved I didn't over know that. because Commoner, I think, is not a thing or he's not in it anymore. So. Oh. Might have to steal Tommy then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always on the lookout now because my band doesn't exist anymore. So I'm like... I'm just waiting for some really good band to break up. And right. I'm going to be like, hey, <laughs> let's, let's start something. Hey, there's a really cool band called Fiction Department. They're awesome. Did they break up? Um, they don't have their drummer because he went to the military. And their lead guitar player is in Minnesota. So it's just their singer and bass player. Uh, they put out a video not that long ago, didn't they? They did, yeah. It uh, was good. They're like kind of like emo kind of. Yeah, they're really good. Punkish. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. So, well, it's not awesome that they're right. breaking up, but but I'm pretty sure that yeah. a new pool of musicians is opening up for the world. Do you play guitar? <laughs> yeah, I played. So I played rhythm guitar and sang in Better Ideas, mm -hmm. but I started out on drums actually. Oh, cool. Um, so I started playing drums when I was in like fifth grade, mm -hmm. and uh, got I was super into that, and I still probably feel the most comfortable behind a drum set than anything else. Yeah. Uh, but then when I was 12, my mom met my stepdad and he played guitar. And so we were always jamming and then he taught me some power chords and then I kind of started teaching myself at that point. So I play a little bit of everything basically, but I started out as a percussionist. Okay. So 
uh, I went to school in McLeod and at the time when I was in fifth grade there, there were no one tried out for drums. It was, I was the only one. And so it was like, there's like 30 people in my class. It was a tiny school and we would play concerts. And because I was the only percussionist, I had like a snare drum and I had a wood block on my snare and a triangle <laughs> hanging from the stand. And then I had the big like cowhide bass drum yes. right next to it. Yeah. And I played like as many parts as I could oh, dude. until finally when I was in like sixth grade, the teacher's like, you just need to play the drum set you need to figure it out. <laughs> but I had never played a drum set at that point. Yeah. Um, until sixth grade. Then I moved to Tongi and I joined a band and then I've just been in bands ever since like playing rock and roll, you That's know? That's awesome. Yeah. Dude, my story's a little bit different. I, I, like so like fifth grade going into sixth grade it's just like that's when you get to choose like what you want to do for sixth grade band mm-hmm. and I told the instructor who's who was also at the time the high school band instructor yeah I was like I want to play drums he's like we don't need a band full of drummers yeah so I was like so did you have too many drummers at that point or? I think so yeah yeah but so that's what that's my understanding is normally when you're in fifth grade everybody wants to play drums yeah so I didn't get yeah. like why am I the only drummer <laughs> that's exactly. so weird so I told him I was like, yeah, I guess I'll, I guess I'll play trumpet, and then I yeah. went home that same day and told my mom, and she's like, no, nah, you're playing drums. Yeah. So like, I didn't do sixth grade band. So I did like private lessons. Oh yeah. For like a couple of years, and then joined up in uh, seventh grade band. Um, just learned like my teacher at the time, Brad Shores. He's a really cool guy, and he was like, he was wanting to teach me rudiments, and at the time I should have been like, okay, yeah. I yeah. Do stupid um yeah. but i was like no i just want to go straight to the drum set so yeah. i did that and yeah then i think i only did that for maybe about a year and then i just did like self-taught stuff mm-hmm. like because i grew up in the the early 2000s emo scene so mm-hmm. i have to have the double pedal and and learn all the learn all the cool songs yeah so that's what i did so then you didn't did you not continue in like band class after I, that or? no i still did yeah like um seventh eighth grade I think I tried out for jazz band, but didn't get the cut. I got cut. So, oh, okay. <laughs> um, but then I went in the high school band, uh, like marching and I played bass mm-hmm. all four years, which was really cool. Cause I think, I think is, is a lot of people think that like snares really hard because like, I think a lot of people are scared to do traditional grip. Yeah. Yeah. But I think bass drum, the tonal bass drums is something that I think is a little more complicated cause you have to count so much more because of the runs that are going down the line from the top yeah, to the bottom, well, and so. the bass drum's not always on the downbeat. You know, it's kind of sometimes an accent or more of a complement to like what the snare and all the other parts are doing. So you have to, like, I, I, because I did marching band too. I was lead snare for a year, and then you just regular snare most yeah. of the time, and played you know cymbals and xylophone, and got moved around a lot. But I did notice that like when you're marching, uh, it was always weird because your left foot starts on the downbeat you know like that's traditional marching but then your right hand is usually what starts like any roll or any 16th note or anything like that on the drum but with the bass drum it's even more complicated because you're not always starting on the offbeat or you're you're alternating in a way to where it's so hard to keep your left foot as the downbeat and then like still maintain that rhythm that's like supporting the rest of the band and when the bass drum's off like the whole band's off. Our, our <laughs> high school instructor used to r- ring us pretty hard because we didn't have like the bass drum runs down. Mm. He's, his saying would be, uh, what was it? You sound like a dryer or you sound like shoes in a dryer. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, and we very we, inconsistent. Oh yeah. So yeah. that was pretty embarrassing when we had to play those parts in front of the yeah. whole entire band and just get, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, Okay. Well, that's awesome. That actually leads me like, that's pretty much what I was going to start the conversation out with was just asking like how you got into playing drums. So it was from band and Mm -hmm. was that, that was your first kind of introduction to music or were you into music before you started playing drums? Way into music. Uh, I think the, the very first like artist that I can remember in my head that I like grasped onto was Garth Brooks. Okay. So I, I saw a few of his shows as a kid and then I remember seeing his drummer which he still does is to this date at their shows, but he is in like this glass cage. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was the coolest thing. And he had like so many drums and cymbals, which I mean, I don't, I don't use that today. I just, yeah. I'm 
basic, but um, I just thought that was the coolest thing. And so I just remember, I'm like, well, I want to learn drums now. And mm-hmm. so I remember like I would, as a kid, I would get like Chinese chopsticks and pretend mm-hmm. I had drumsticks and whatnot. But then I, I think as I got older, I started listening to more like eighties music. So like my mom had, I grabbed like her lover boy record and you yeah. know, like everyone's working for the weekend and started latching onto the the eighties. Yeah. Kind of just moved through country to pop to rock and mm-hmm. rock is where I pretty much stayed. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So then how did that lead into getting into the Dear Misses? Well, I honestly, the Dear Misses is actually my first band. Really? Uh, I've never. Wow. I've never played in a band before. I've. W- my first job, I met this uh, this guy. His name is Matt. And we had the very similar taste in music, like Taking Back Sunday. And at the time, brand new. Mm. Don't some of those guys anymore. You don't? No, I can't after the whole. Oh Jesse yeah. Thing, so. See, I try to just stay out of that because I uh, freaking love their music. Uh, <laughs> at times, I will probably see myself. If I put my iPhone on shuffle and play through music. I, I think that comes. Yeah. I, to be honest, I don't know that like the gist of that whole story, like everything that went down. Yeah. Because I'm a late bloomer when it comes to emo. I've literally listened to music backwards my whole life. Like when I got super into it, it was like. Well, in the beginning, it was just like whatever was on the radio is what I was into. And so at the time, it was like Blink, and that yeah. was kind of the punk rock, like Blink and Green Day and stuff like that. And I feel like I'm just now getting into like 2000s emo <laughs> and like the earlier stuff. So it's weird because I'm kind of out of the loop when it comes to the drama on like Brand New and, and stuff like yeah. that. But their new album is just it's the, amazing, dude. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, so good. Off the subject, but on... <laughs> their new album what's really crazy is if you i think the song is can't get it out i think yeah oddly enough my guitarist cody was Uh listening to the album and i was in somewhere in the house like i think the kitchen he's like brett holy crap come here i'm like what's up like he just Mm -hmm. like freaked me out he's like listen to this it's like because it's you know the the track had just released Uh and we listened to it he's like what does this sound like I started, I started listening to the riff, to the bass riff, and I'm mm-hmm. like, wow, that actually sounds like um, the beginning riff of our song called Stage Fright. So, oh, yeah, where so, it goes from G to like B, the, yeah, yes. So I was the, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, because it's like, dude, dun, 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 that's dun, so dun. weird. Because when I was, I was doing my research, you know, trying to get caught up on all your guys' stuff for this episode, and I listened to that song, I was like, oh, that's like the exact same kind of intervals i guess yeah. for the verses mm-hmm. and it did it reminded me of it a lot yeah, so I thought it was crazy, <laughs> it's crazy. So I was like, wow that's awesome dude that is insane all right so anyways you meet matt and you guys like the some of the same music and somehow this leads to starting a band or we just honestly the furthest we got was jamming and yeah. it was just us two we didn't get like anybody we had like a couple of friends like record us on their digital camera mm-hmm. uh, and actually their those videos are on my facebook so wow. you'll you'll see those you can see those videos if you if you go to my Facebook profile. But um, yeah, all we did we just took inspiration from like Taking Back Sunday, um, the Used, Brand New, mm-hmm. um, some other bands, and so we kind of just wrote music around that. We had a lot of we had we had a good time, but yeah, we just never the wheels were going, but mm-hmm. the car didn't take us anywhere. So we kind of yeah. just left it at that, and um, we both went our separate ways. And like I said, eventually I moved from Hutch to Lawrence. So, okay. And uh-huh. it, so is that how you met all the, well, you said all the guys from dear misses are from Hutch also, right? Yeah. So Todd was actually my drum major in marching band. Okay. And I was wow. like so intimidated by him because he was so good at drums. Yeah. Um, so I was like, Oh my God, this guy's amazing. Yeah. Um, Cody actually was a football player. Um, I never, and then Shane's from Lindsburg, so just like 20 minutes outside of Hutch. But mm-hmm. I never knew him until uh, I actually met the guys in 222. Oh, okay. So like 2010. But yeah, so Cody, Todd, and I are from Hutch. Uh, we really didn't know each other all that well. I just knew Todd. He was my drum major. He was awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cody, I, I knew through my brother because my brother was the same age as Cody. Um, but we didn't really become like friends, friends until like I moved to Lawrence in 2010 so um that's when we kind of all started talking and jamming and Todd and Cody were in this band uh called Left on Northwood okay so at the end of Left on Northwood Todd had kind of started writing 
acoustic songs mm-hmm. um, that ended up being the Dear Mrs. tracks. Okay. So, but I was only in Lawrence for about two and a half years, and I moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico for a girlfriend at the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Didn't work out. So I moved from Santa Fe back to Hutch, was there for about nine months, and I knew it was like, this is only a way station. I'm going to move somewhere, somewhere else again. Yeah. So I moved back to Lawrence because Todd and Cody heard that I was back mm-hmm. and they're like, Hey, we're trying to get this project off the ground, come play drums for it. So yeah, that was kind of like the reason why I moved back to Lawrence again in 2014 was to yeah. help them start this project. So that's yeah. kind of where it all started. And, um, yeah, then I moved back and then we started jamming in my basement and then we actually recorded some of the tracks that you hear on, uh, just let go in my basement. So. Okay. And that's the full length. Yes. Yeah, so you guys, length. okay. That's the next thing I was going to ask about. Cause you guys have a full length album, which a lot of like local bands just don't, it's usually yeah. EPs. Mm-hmm. And so from what it sounds like you guys recorded it yourself. Is yeah. That- yeah. We didn't, so we didn't have like a budget or any money to do it. Yeah. But luckily Todd had, or he had pro tools. And so we were able just to plug in and, mm-hmm. and, record everything like that um yeah. all the drums are actually electronic mm-hmm. so samples was, yeah so yeah. we just did it on his electronic rolling kit mm-hmm. and then we just like mixed the stems and everything yeah um so no acoustic drums were on that record but yeah mm-hmm. we did everything by ourselves i felt so bad for todd because he mixed every single song yeah that's a lot of work it is so i i mean yeah that was that was a lot i felt so bad because he was there was like so many mixes for every song, you know, there's probably mm-hmm. about 30 mixes per song. So yeah. And we had 10 songs on that record. So dang. Yeah. That's insane. <sighs> yeah. No, it was great. So how long did it take? Like, what was the recording process? Like when you're doing it all yourself? Cause like my last man, we tried for so many different times to record ourselves, but mm-hmm. none of us really had the like knowledge to know how to work like pro tools. Like I've been using garage band forever. Yeah. I finally got logic somewhat recently bad timing because it was after the band broke up but (laughs) like we and we tried the whole library thing for a little bit and all that so like did todd have any education in logic or was it all just kind of diy like learn it as you go like was that kind of your first experience with recording a full length yeah i think yeah he learned everything through for pro tools like he just went through and you know worked out the bugs yeah uh, for recording and and he got it down pretty well because like whenever I watched him record, I'm just like, I don't know what you're doing, but yeah, you're doing good. So yeah, no, it was kudos to him because he just spent so much time on that record and, and um, mixing it, producing Matt. Well, I think Shane actually mastered. He has, he has a mastering program that we mastered with, but okay, yeah, no, that, it, but just sitting down there and watching him record and in his element was really cool to, to see that. So yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And you guys just put out a new single. So how'd you record yeah. that? Did you also do that yourself? Or? No, no. So that was different because I was super excited about we, so we, it all kind of started the, so Mr. All the same, by the way. Yeah. Check it out. <laughs> so our friends, sweet ascent, mm-hmm. their producer, Kevin, Kevin Gates. Okay. Was doing a promotion for like the new year where like uh submit your demo uh and then the top five out of those submissions will be put up for a vote whoever wins the vote will get a free recording so i'm like this is perfect we've got like at wow. least a few demos that we yeah. can that we can do this for um so we talked about it and we thought we have this track all the same it's pretty much finished let's it was a little bit lengthy. We mm-hmm. tend to write really long songs. I think the longest song we have is about six and a half minutes. Yeah, <laughs> and if any of the stories are correct from Jordan, Kevin will just say, yep, cut that, cut that, yep. cut that. That's trash. He'll let you do everything once Yeah. if, I, if I'm if i not mistaken. I think that sounds about right from what I remember talking with Jake and Jordan about that. Yeah. Um, so they had, a, they had a, a time limit, which is four minutes. I think at the time all the same was tr- uh, it was r- the run time was about five and a half minutes. Okay. So we had to shave and and do things differently. So we cut it down to four minutes. Mm-hmm. Submitted it. You know, we went through the whole voting process. We ended up losing. Mm. So we're like, oh, I was kind of disappointed. I was like, man. Yeah. Um. But lo and behold, I somehow came across this Facebook post that some other friends had entered in or liked and it was uh it's a it's a so matt richards 
mm-hmm. runs Avenue Rec- Avenue Record Company in Kansas City uh, at his home, mm-hmm. and he has this uh, little thing that he's doing where like you know tag your band, tag a tag an individual, and uh, you know the more tags the better. I'll throw it into a randomizer, mm-hmm. and then whatever it lands on is the winner of this uh, prize, which is two free songs recorded, produced, mixed, and mastered. Wow. So okay. I was like. I was looking at the entries. I'm like, man, there's this one band that has like 30, 40 entries. I'm like, mm-hmm. let's try. So I was like, yeah, having people tag us in there if, if they could, uh, if they wanted, <laughs> close friends, yeah, and family, and somehow we won. It was really cool. Randomizer. That's awesome. So you got two, two recordings then. Two recordings. Yeah. So does that mean you guys are working on another one right now? Or yes, we finally Todd finally went in and put vocals down on the second song. Awesome. So I think there's probably one more section that we have to put vocals to, and then it's off to post production. But so we won. So we won this, and we met with Matt, awesome guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, Avenue Record Company um, in Kansas City, and we talked about kind of you know what we were looking at, and we gave him some songs that we've been working on and then we decided on all the same mm-hmm. and then another song that we have that'll be coming out soon hopefully awesome. um so and yeah we started tracking so that was actually this what we recorded was my actual first time in a studio i've never recorded in a studio yeah and so was, you got to do the you got to bring your drums in and all that and mic them up and yeah that's cool yeah so would, did he I know most producers do, so it might be a stupid question, but did he take your original drums and then kind of mix some samples in with it? Or like, is it raw drums? It's raw drums. That was a really cool thing. That's Uh, awesome. So I, I, for the longest time I've taken pride in, in tuning. Mm -hmm. Like I'm obsessed with just making sure that like it sounds right. It sounds good. Yeah. Uh, That was kind of like in the, like a first initial meeting we had, it was like, yeah, we might have to sample your drums out. It just depends um, yeah, but we went in there and, and I'm like, will we have to sample these? And he's like, no, nah, dude. And he's like, it sounds really good. I'm not going to do anything to that. Awesome, so dude. I felt really proud just because yeah. I like, spent all this time, all these years, like tuning by ear and, and just making sure that everything sounds really good. Yeah. So I, was, I feel like that's definitely a rarity because every, like I've only worked with a few different producers. I worked with John Eddy, who w- was uh sweet ascent's old guitarist. Oh, okay. And I guess Kevin taught him a lot of stuff and, and I, remember going in and i so our drummer quit like halfway through recording this ep and so he he was on the first single that we released and then the rest of the songs that only one of them ended up getting released because the band just didn't make it through the whole recording process but i did play drums on every song and then i remember coming over a while ago and i guess my drum like you know how producers are. They're like, if it doesn't sound good, they're just going to replace it. And I'm yeah. like heartbroken. Cause I'm like, wait, what happened to like that fill or what, Yeah. what happened here? And he's like, well, dude, th- they weren't tuned. Right. Like I had uh, to sample everything. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. it's kind of, kind of a bummer, but I, I, I also get it because I feel like nowadays the music industry or just in general, like just people like consumers that listen to music, they kind of expect a certain quality. And it's kind of, it's a bummer because I feel like most artists, especially drummers, they just want to hear them. They want to hear yeah. themselves and they want to hear that like authentic sound, but it's really hard to get that without spending thousands of dollars on like proper, you know, brand new drum heads every time you yeah. record a song and, you know, knowing exactly how to tune everything, getting the, the right mics and the right producer and the right room and all of that. So it's like, kind of a catch 22 of like how raw can you make a song or how authentic can you make it without overproducing it? Right. And then how do you, uh, how do you put the right amount of production on it? That's something I've always been really curious about and kind of scared Mm -hmm. to do because I, like I've been working on, uh, basically just kind of a demo EP, uh, like kind of a solo thing and I really want to record it, but that's something I'm afraid of is I've got the demo itis where I like, (laughs) I like the way that it sounds, even though it sounds terrible, <laughs> like, right, yeah, but yeah. it's, it's like, it's real, you yeah. know? So it's like it, when you're looking for a producer, you're ready to record an album. You kind of have to like let go of your art yeah. yes, in a way, because you know, it's going to be completely different probably from how it started in its beginning stages. Yeah. So like, is that something that you guys have dealt with in the studio? Like, have you, uh, well, I guess you did the whole first album on your own, so right. it was probably exactly what you wanted <laughs> right, and yeah. like exactly how yeah. you knew how to play it. But like with the uh, 
what was the production company again? You or the recording studio? Avenue Record Avenue. Company. Yeah. Record how was that? Like, how was that working with somebody who might be, you know, might have their own influence and stuff like that on your music? Matt was actually really cool about letting us do what we'd actually originally written. That's um, awesome. So, as far as like changing things, there wasn't really a lot of changes. You know, we we might have layered a couple things that are actually on the final recording of all the same from what we actually had on the original demo, but mm -hmm. everything that we had written or changed so many times on that song actually made the song. So yeah. there's just maybe the first verse is actually something that we didn't um, plan on mm -hmm. having in there, but it's, it's on the song, but everything else is originally how we wrote it, which is really cool. So that is he doesn't cool. really go in there. Yeah. I mean, he'll suggest things mm -hmm. obviously um, cause it's nice to have, an outside perspective of your music. Yeah, absolutely. That was the one thing that we were desperately missing from, from Just Let Go, the, the mm -hmm. record. Um, so it was really nice having him there to say, you know, what to do, what not to do, which is really cool. Yeah, so, but for yeah, sure. Other than that, like I said, just having the original product in there from what we did demoing wise was was there. That's awesome. So, yeah, that's awesome. So what's your guys' writing process like then? Does it because you said uh, what's the singer's name? Todd. Todd. Mm -hmm. You said he wrote like acoustic stuff originally and yep. then you guys um i'm assuming kind of took the bones of that and then like added you know more electric guitars and your drum parts um so is that like how your songs start initially most of the time or is it kind of a collective thing like you guys all write in the same room like together yeah i think well originally todd had like an acoustic cody has this magical mind of like once you give something to him he will just he'll spend an evening or two just he can pump out a full song really quickly that's cool like if you if he's off for a day and he's like i'm inspired i'm gonna write a song like he can get pretty much half a song to a song written in a day that's cool so that's what he did with todd's stuff and he's your guitarist yeah lead guitarist okay yeah that dude plays crazy <laughs> he like does. He's, he's the one that plays upside down right upside like down, psychedelic yeah yeah like i've seen him <laughs> before he was in your guys's band was he in it like a long time ago and did he take a break or did he just join a little bit later? Because no. I saw him with Get Busy Living like oh, yeah. a really long time ago. Yep. And I think I saw him with another band too. Was it 222? Or? Yeah, he did stuff with uh, Get Busy Living, which is now Renegades. Okay. They've kind of gone through some changes. But okay. yeah, he, I didn't even realize that. I'm kind of <laughs> yeah. out of the loop right yeah. now. <laughs> so he did stuff for with, uh, with Chase um, from Get Busy Living mm -hmm. and then he also did play as a second guitarist for 222 okay uh back a while ago so yeah but but he was in a band with todd so todd was actually todd was the drummer in left uh left on northwood and cody was the bass player okay so on this new project todd moved from drums to front man and mm -hmm. cody went from bass to lead guitar okay so but they they wrote most of that stuff just the two of them oh, okay um demoed it out um but writing process, like we all kind of have our own ideas. So Cody has a lot of the stuff that he's written. So we kind of mm -hmm. just, he'll have ideas. He'll put them out and like, it's like, Hey, this is what I wrote. Like, what do you guys think? You know, we'll mm -hmm. kind of maybe if we need to make changes, we'll make changes. Todd just has like, he's shown us on multiple occasions. He's got like this massive list on his phone mm -hmm. of just like clips of him playing like something on acoustic or piano. Mm -hmm. He's got like 30 to 40 ideas at a time. So yeah. he just, he's off in his own world writing music uh, whenever he's got okay. an idea and he will record it yeah. as soon as possible. Um, but as far as like, me and Todd can actually collaborate on the drums. So like if, even if he does like record a demo, like we'll talk about it back and forth and say, you know, like change parts or keep it the same. Just, you know, cause yeah. I, I feel like it's like that Dave Grohl, uh, early Foo Fighters. Mm -hmm. Not, not really. It's not like we're, we don't butt heads like his old drummer and like he gets mm -hmm. kicked out, but it's just like, it's, he's, a, he's a drummer at heart. Yeah. So like, yeah, he, he likes to have like that. Um, he knows the, like the, the root of all the songs, which is cool. I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. So, but yeah, dude, that's cool. cool. I actually relate to that a lot because, um, like I was a drummer also. Mm -hmm. And then I became the front man of this band. I was a drummer in every other band before that. And then my last one was, I was singing and playing rhythm. Um, but I am a drummer first probably. Yeah. So 
you know, especially when you're like a singer and a, a kind of a rhythm guitarist and you're playing rock and roll, like the drums kind of write themselves for a lot of it, yeah. you know, like, especially if you have, you know, you have like a palm muted kind of chunky yep. riff or something, then you kind of know where the kick drums needs to go or the snare kind of what is going to complement it. So I, I totally, uh, well, I guess my drummer probably felt your pain a little bit on like, <laughs> Hey, uh, don't, don't make up your own fill there. <laughs> like yeah. play, play the one I had originally yeah. <laughs> or like that well, kind of, uh, working together with with another drummer especially when they're they're not the drummer in the right. band but they are a drummer right and like that's probably a a bridge you got to get over yeah and i honestly todd todd and cody both just said at the beginning like like you can make it whatever you want like if you want to change something on these songs that we had written it was just the first 10 songs on just let go yeah and he's like you know put your flavor on it do do whatever you want to do so i'm like cool and i didn't really i i'd rather just like at the time, I was super nervous because I I just moved back again from New Mexico and I hadn't really touched my drums in like a year. Yeah. So I sucked. Girlfriends, mm. man. I know. Yeah. <laughs> geez. And I didn't have my drums because my drums were in Kansas because yeah. there's no basements in New Mexico. I don't have to worry about tornadoes. Oh, dang. So. Yeah. Uh, but eventually, I got them down and I played a little bit, but not as much as I as uh, I do now. But I got back and I sucked. I couldn't even play. I think Cody came over. Because his his parents live five blocks away from where my mom lives, mm-hmm. um, so that's when we, sorry, I moved back to Hutch. He came up from Lawrence or came down from Lawrence, and we started practicing. The first thing he showed me was our song "Devil," and okay. there like this groove I just could not play for the life of me. But I spent, I, they gave me all the songs that they had, and I worked on them every single day for probably about two or three months yeah just to get the parts right i had to relearn grooves syncopations and yeah it was it was brutal but those are it, it was something fun to you know like put my head down and like because i'm like i'm a drummer i've been playing i've wanted to like give up so many times but like these guys have given me an opportunity yeah. to like be the drummer and, mm-hmm. and and whatnot so yeah i kept my head down and just kept practicing all those songs i think there's 10 or 12 songs i practiced yeah. for about two or three months just to make sure that it, it was a fully functional song. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I feel like I've never had to practice, like I've never joined a band that already had a lot of songs already written, but I did do, uh, I played bass for Sweet Ascent for a project oh, okay, that's yeah. not out yet. I don't know why. Hurry up, guys. <laughs> um, but like just the kind of nerves of like trying to learn these parts and I played bass. So it wasn't like the most important, but you know, if it's off, you're going to be able to tell, especially if you'd like earn a car, you know, have yeah. decent speakers. Yeah. I couldn't imagine being the drummer and having to learn these songs like right before a show or before something like that. Cause it's like, if the drums mess up or like you like anything, it's so obvious and like yeah. so scary to think about like, all right, Hey, you want to be a fill in drummer? We got a show in a month. <laughs> and learn these 10 songs and I would be so nervous to know like where all the stops and starts are like where the breaks are where the fills are anytime the drums are supposed to just fade out completely (laughs) but if you keep playing right there like that's terrifying yeah I uh actually and you know fast forward and we finally played our first show as a band in 2015 at the jackpot Mm -hmm. um is my first show ever I'd never played an actual like appropriate show yeah um but yeah dude I was so nervous I was like I was just like sweating so much and, yeah. I, was like, and I was, you know, stretching cause we were about to go on and I'm like, yeah. so I was freaking out. I'm like, I'm like, can I be, can I hear the monitor? I mean, I know the wedges right here, but am I going to be able to hear everything? Yeah. So that, that's how much yeah. in my head I was. But, um, I think I messed up a couple of times at our first show, but it was, it was pretty cool, man. I, that, yeah. that was one of the best feelings in the world and getting on the stage now is it's, I, I'm not as nervous as, as a, that first show was. Yeah, that got to me really yeah. bad. But like, I think halfway through our show, I felt more comfortable and we got through it. So yeah, that's awesome. I wonder how many bands had their first show at the jackpot. Is it like everyone around here? I, f- I feel like yeah, I feel like it is. Um, yeah, but yeah, that was our first one, and yeah, it just kind of kickstarted from there to where we are now, which is pretty cool. So. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. So. What what would you say are like the best and the worst parts of being a drummer in a band? Start with maybe either one actually, either one. <laughs> the worst part in my bandmates, and I think anybody that has been in a band can say like, oh, I agree with that. Is helping your drummer out, like yeah, with all of his equipment. 
because yes. we have so many pieces of equipment. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so carrying like my just loading and getting it into the venue, out of the venue, because I think I'm I have some pretty heavy duty hardware, and I think my hardware bag weighs about 180 pounds. Jeez. So I think that's the worst thing, and and then taking it upstairs if you have to take it upstairs, mm-hmm. which I've had to do at, at least a couple. Especially like we played at the Homegrown Buzz Music Showcase mm. in Kansas City for 96.5 The Buzz. And I had to take my hardware up the flights of the stairs in Power and Light. So if you've ever been there, know what those stairs looks like. It's yeah, it's crazy. Really bad. Yeah. That's insane. Um, eh, I would say, I don't know. I like being loud. So I guess the drums are, for me, that's kind of, <laughs> I never really wanted anybody ever hear me play. Yeah. Drums were just like the stupidest reasoning. And I'm like, you're playing the loudest <laughs> instrument. Yeah, it's hard so not to. <laughs> people are going to hear you. <laughs> yeah, for um, sure. But I think it's just like the best thing is just like being so creative. Mm-hmm. Like there's so many things you can do on the drums. I mean, with yeah. any instrument really, but I don't know what it is about drums that I, I just like hitting super. Well, not really hard. I'm, I like to serve the music and be dynamic, yeah. but yeah. Uh, it's just something about bashing stuff yeah, yeah. so it's like an energy thing you yeah know? like do you feel like something gets let out you know like you're like something's flowing through you when you're playing yeah. drums like i don't know like is I've, I've been thinking about this a lot and i want to start asking more musicians this because i, I it's always a, a different answer and maybe it's kind of a both and thing but i've always wondered if if music especially with drums because you don't think about drums when you're doing it you know you might think about it like the process of it when you're writing or when mm-hmm. you're when you're practicing to learn a, a song but once you know it you, it just kind of happens right so I'm like wondering do you think that music is something that it's like it's like a feeling or an emotion something that flows through you or is it something that you're creating like what is it I guess what does it mean to be creative in that way like do you think like when you're playing drums are you playing the drums or the drum, the drums just like kind of being played, and you're just like the vessel for for that sound. Like, I feel like I'm the vessel sometimes more than anything. I don't know what it is, but I feel like I just get I get super lost in it. Like yeah. I'm there, but like it's just I, I the experience is I don't know. I I guess I don't know how to really describe it, but like yeah, when I'm playing, man, it's just I don't know. It's not. It's not. It's yeah. a hard, it's hard. It is <laughs> it like, really it's is. a meta, very meta question. So yeah. that's part of it. No, it's, but I've been trying to figure that out. Cause I used to ask this question. I asked Zach Mayfield this in the, one of the first uh, episodes where I was like, if you were the only guy left on earth, would you make art? And that I think kind of relates to that question because that brings up like, well, do you make art for you or do you make it for other people? Um, and and today I was thinking about it before this podcast and I'm like, well, I used to say that I would still create art if I was the only person on the planet because I used to make art when I was in my room by myself and I did it all a ton for my own amusement. But then as the more I have been thinking about it, I see it as something that sort of comes through as like a message that we're supposed to share with other people. Yeah. So I wonder if there would be any point if there's no one else to share it with because it seems like art or music especially, is a way, uh, sort of an indirect way to describe the world or whatever mm-hmm. you're going through, right. whatever is hard, yep. whatever you hate, whatever you love, whatever mm-hmm. it is. And so I don't know if there would be a reason for it if if not to share with other people, which makes me, uh, you know, which brings me to my first question is like, what is music? Like, what is this thing yeah. that we're doing that's like just making noises? Like, is it something that we're doing or is it just something that happens and we just get to be there to like witness it. Cause I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I know how to play music. Like I, <laughs> you know, I did band class right. and I, I understand some of the theories at the theory aspect of it. But when I'm actually doing it, I don't feel like I know what I'm doing. I just feel like it's kind of happening. No, I agree with you know? that. Yeah. I feel with the, with the happening because it's just, it's, it's a creative process. So you yeah. kind of just, you know, get to figure out the bad parts and the good parts. Um, but you know the whole thing with like making art for you or for someone else i always felt like it's just for you Mm. and if other people like it then they like it i feel like that's like what most like my favorite well i know it's my favorite band but i I think it's todd and cody's but our favorite band is thrice okay and i know like they have they started i mean they're from orange county Mm. so they 
their biggest thing I influences that were punk back in the nineties. So they went from being like a punk band to a hard rock band mm-hmm. to more like, uh, they got really, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of experimental yeah with like some of the concept albums Mm -hmm. but they've changed they never stayed the same Mm -hmm. but they're writing music for themselves yeah which is great and i think that goes for all bands you know they'll write music you know i think i can think of another band like a day to remember Mm -hmm. like they were really i'm not sure really how to describe what their earlier stuff was i would almost call it like pop punk or something yeah so like Like, when they changed from that people mm -hmm. are like what is this yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, yeah. well, they're making music for themselves, not yeah. for you. Like, if you like it, that's cool. If not, then, I mean. Yeah, that's so true. And then I, I feel like whenever an artist writes for other people, it's kind of when they lose whatever they had in the first place. Yeah. You know, like, and I think that happens to a lot of bands, which is why they always say that the second album is kind of like what makes or breaks them. And I think it's because like once you've put out something that's like authentic and genuine and it's you Mm -hmm. and it was for you. Um, and that's everyone's first album because you didn't know if anyone was going to like it. So you wrote what you like. And then if people like it and it kind of gets a little bit of a following, then I think a lot of artists kind of get this idea in their head of like, well, I need to either do something drastically different to get people's attention or I need to kind of do more of the same, but either way they're thinking about, those other people when they're writing and they're not just thinking about what do I want to do. Right. And then, so they kind of lose that like spark, whatever that was that made them awesome or interesting in the first place is kind of like being kind of distorted by like this, this worry of like, well, are they going to like it or, mm-hmm. or like, and so I think you're right. Like, I think you're definitely onto something with like, you need to write, like if you're going to make art, what, even if it's not music, it needs to be like for you initially. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe with the ultimate goal of sharing it with other people to possibly relate to it. But if you have those other people in mind when you write it, it sort of taints it. It right. kind of taints the creativity and takes away from what you would have done if there were no circumstances that made you want to change things. Yeah. You know, that's and that's crazy to me. Like it, it, it's such a hard thing because, you know, like that idea of like if you're the last man on earth, what are you going to make? It's going to be crazy because you, yeah. you don't have to worry about anyone. That's true. You don't have to worry about anyone hearing it. So, like, is that what the best artists do? Do they just, like, make – they just make whatever they want to make without any, like, care about what other people are going to think and then just release that to the world and just see, like, what they think? Like, I don't know. I don't know how that I, works. I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I feel like when I, you know, you were just talking about that, mm-hmm. the first person I thought about was Jim Carrey. Because yeah. a lot of people don't know that he actually does art. Yeah, he's a great painter. He really is. Yeah. And it's, uh, a lot of people think he's a super eccentric, but they're also disappointed at the same time that he's not like this goofball like he was in Ace Ventura or yeah. any of his other movies. But yeah, yeah, he's a creative artist. He creates art about, you know, what's going on in the world, but also he yeah. does it for himself. I mean, if no one's ever seen Jim Carrey paint, like YouTube it, watch it. Yeah, it's dude, did you watch his documentary? Uh, it's called like Me and Andy or something like that. Yeah, when he one? was when he was and Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman. Yeah, what would yep. you think about that? That was crazy, wasn't he, it? He dove into another dimension. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah. and just stayed there. You know, he's yeah. in character. He's a very just. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just I was like, wow. I, yeah. So what do you think it is? Because I feel like a lot of people, I want to talk about this for a long time, yeah. actually, because I feel like a lot of people think that he's kind of lost it. But what I hear him saying are like fundamental truths yeah. of like the universe. Yep. And I feel like he's trying to kind of be like this kind of Alan Watts or like Terrence McKenna type, like a guru yeah. almost. And I, I can't tell if it's genuine or if like he's just assuming that role or like, did he really wake up? Like, is he enlightened? Would you say like, I feel, yeah. And I think that's the, where the point, like, cause I think the first time I really got a dose of kind of what we're talking about mm-hmm. was, um, my girlfriend was saying that like one of her coworkers was talking about Jerry Seinfeld's new 
uh, show on Netflix. Oh, the called writing coffee and, and writing in cars, getting coffee with celebrities or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and with comedians. I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first uh, the first episode was with Jim Carrey. Yeah. So, uh, and I guess one of her coworkers was saying that he's very eccentric. He's weird. Yeah. But I'm like, I don't know. I don't think that's him. So I watched the episode, and then I was listening to what he was saying to Jerry Seinfeld. Mm-hmm. I'm like dude's not weird he's just he's like speaking the truth he's very yeah. like he like i said he's not like the character like you saw on like the mask or he's, yeah he's just he's a person yeah and he has you know uh just these uh thoughts that are very truthful and you know i yeah I, there's nothing wrong with well that. i feel like we're just at a time in history where the truth is weird yeah you know like because what like Every, every time we've had a messiah figure or like, you know, like a Jesus or a Buddha or a Muhammad or, uh, you know, I'd even put MLK up there. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, they all had their, their flaws or whatever, but at the time they were weird, you know, like mm-hmm. they were the weirdos. Yeah. And I feel like someday we're going to look back and be like, dang, that Jim Carrey, <laughs> like he was on to something. He was yeah. on to like some metaphysical truths. Yeah. But because he's so funny and goofy, we can't take him seriously. Yeah. And I feel like that might be kind of what helped him get to the point that he's at because he doesn't take himself seriously. And I think that's why it's so easy for him to just go. Like, did you see he went to this? Uh, it was like some red carpet award thing or something. He got all dressed up. Are you, do you know what I'm yeah, talking about? I I and that. so he goes to this event and he get he lets some lady interview her. He mm-hmm. just shows up and has like nothing to do with him. He's like, yeah, I wanted to come to the most material and just useless event that I could possibly find and put on a nice suit and just you know come and just act useless, come and waste my time. And, you yeah. know, and he's just like making fun of it, and the world doesn't know how to receive it. Yeah. Right? And, and it's because like he's it's like a social experiment. Yeah. He's like poking fun at just how weird all of this is like reality, our mm-hmm. government, our media, TV personalities. And like, he yep. is at the forefront of, you know, Hollywood. And so I think he knows firsthand, like how weird all of this is. Yeah. So it was so cool to see him just go and like dissect it in a weird, in a, like a kind of comedic, like social experiment sort of way. Yeah. And I think because of that, people took that whole thing the other way and like, Jim Carrey goes off on a reporter. Yeah, and he, they and tried to paint him out like a yeah, bad guy I was or like, something. That is not, that's not what he's doing. Yeah, it and was, I don't think it had anything to do with the reporter. I think yeah. he, you know, she was just kind of caught in the crossfire of like, I think he went there with that intent. Like, right. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna just expose how weird and pointless all of this is. Yeah, and I think he did a pretty good job. No, he did. Yeah. Still a big fan of Jim Carrey. Yeah, way. yeah, same. So if anyone hasn't seen, uh, is it called Jim and Andy? Or me and Andy? Me and Andy. Something, something. like that. Just check yeah. out the Jim Carrey documentary because it's amazing. Really and don't judge him, okay? <laughs> He's just a goofy guy. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I like all that type of stuff. Like, I'm super into, um, like, Alan Watts. I don't know if you ever listened to any of his lectures, but he's kind of the guy that brought um, Buddhism or the idea of Zen Buddhism. He, he Americanized it, essentially, okay. and, like, kind of made it you know, tangible in a way that we can understand it and process it. And so like in the sixties, you know, he's, he's kind of the reason for like those, like kind of uppity, like Zen type hippie people, you know, like in a good way, but also in a bad way. But, uh, yeah, I just, I love all that stuff. And I think that music is like one of the outlets of something that is some sort of metaphysical truth. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why I'm so interested in talking to artists all the time is because I feel like by having conversations with other artists, it's the best way to learn about like where that comes from. Cause like I'm on a mission, you know, like I want to know what inspires people, like what, what causes you to create, what, what, comes through when you're when you're trying to be creative and you're trying to make something like that and is it are are you hitting on some of the same truths or some of the same energies I guess you could say that you know people like Jim Carrey or Alan Watts or Mm -hmm. Buddha or Jesus or any of those people are hitting on and I don't know it's just a theory at this point (laughs) but I, I have got some ideas about like just why music affects us in the way that it does. And it's, it's really cool. You know? Yeah. Like, have you ever met anybody that doesn't like music? 
Like, it, does that exist? Like, I don't, I don't know. I think of, in my lifetime, maybe one person, which I thought it was super strange why they didn't like music. I yeah. Don't, I don't know how it could survive life without music. Yeah. So, yeah. So what do you think about all this? Like, do you, what does music do for you? Like if you could describe it, what, what is it? Oh my God. <laughs> that, I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I've honestly, I've thought about that where I've had moments to myself. I'm like, well, really, what is music? And like, I don't, I don't know, man. I just, I, it's to, to think of like where it came from in the first place. Yeah. Into like where it is now to like fill in the gaps of how it progressed yeah from how it began and how it is now but i could never truly answer that question yeah like i don't it's just like to this day like one of the the big one of my biggest questions is i have no idea and i, yeah. I can't come up with good reason yeah i, I don't know <laughs> that's a good answer <laughs> i know but like uh yeah no it still baffles me but it's it's cool because like the music that you know, whatever you create art wise it can affect a person. So I think to me, like there's been a lot of things in music that have like really like reached out and like grabbed my soul and yeah, just was yeah. like, like, um, yeah. Like when you get the chills. Yeah, man, like the chills. Feeling. I honestly, like I can tell you like the first time I ever heard, uh, one of the songs off the record we released is called throne. Mm. And I, it was just a demo. There was no vocals but I heard, I heard the, um, I heard the bridge kick in for some reason out of nowhere, I got really attached to it and mm-hmm. I started crying. I don't know why, Wow. but I just started crying and that's, yeah. I mean, it's no BS, but it's the truest thing. And I remember Cody having me listen to that song and mm-hmm. for some reason I just, I kind of let go. Yeah. I just started crying. I'm like, I, where did this come from? Wow. And so it's from I, one of your guys' songs. One of our too. songs, yeah. Wow. And it's uh and to actually learn what it was about was it, it's a it's a pretty throne is I mean it's about <clears throat> I think how Todd really described it was because they him and his friends in high school lost a friend in high school. Oh wow. So it's kind of like yeah. him and you know the group trying to stay together to to keep it together. Mm-hmm. Um and so there's a lot of references to, you know losing someone and i remember we actually we played that at our first show and uh, my friend jason when he heard it he had just lost his uncle probably about uh, a month ago mm. and there's a part in the song uh where it says reach into this guy toast or something like that i can't remember todd's lyrics i'm sorry todd mm-hmm. um but like he told me about that and he's like when i heard that it made me cry wow so i was like wow so yeah i don't know what it is man lyrics yeah i, I don't know it's and for like one of my friends to like have the same reaction I did to that part in the song too. Yeah. I was like, wow. That's it's just crazy. No, it is, man. It is. Like, and I don't know. To me, it almost feels like a form of worship at that point. Mm-hmm. Like, even if you don't believe in a higher power or anything, it's like that it's like that energy that that is everything. And it's like it's like this is one outlet of that. And when you get when you feel it you know, Mm -hmm. and it's like, everyone knows that feeling. And I think as an artist, like to be able to be a vessel to, for that to come through is such an honor. It's such a cool thing to be able to bring that feeling to other people, Mm -hmm. whether or not it's you, like, we don't really know. I think we've established that, (laughs) but like you're, you get to be a part of it. And that's such a cool thing. And that's like, I think that's what, like going to shows and like local music is all about is, yeah. is creating the space where that, that is possible for yeah. people to come and to have a song that they relate to, or it gives them the chills or it makes them cry or it makes them happy or it makes yeah. them want to push all their buddies around into a chair. <laughs> like whatever it is, it's like, it's like a release, but it's also something that's just like, it's like, it's like an answer to a problem, yeah. you know, like it, it's something that, that you, you didn't know you needed until you got it. And you're like, wow, yeah. that is cool. No, it was, it was really cool because going to shows like, yeah, I, I was like on the other end of the receiving part of that, but you know, like mm-hmm. getting to feel the emotion, but then being on the stage yeah. and giving that to people was just like, it was yeah. something different, man. It's I a mean, whole different and you, thing. And you know that, so. A little bit. Yeah. And, like, I feel like I haven't played enough shows to get to the point where I was comfortable, mm-hmm. like, truly comfortable. 
I think that I've experienced like that kind of flow state you get into, you know, where you, you know, like the show's over and you oh, know, yeah. you're like, Oh wait, where did that go? Where was <laughs> yeah. I? Like, I yeah. forgot to enjoy it, you yeah. know, but I like, I feel like that's a whole different thing, especially whenever an artist has been around for a while and that's their home, that's their comfort zone is being on stage. Then I feel like you get a whole, uh, a whole different energy and they, they really do become like a vessel at that point. Mm-hmm. The best example I've ever seen of that is green day nowadays. Yeah. Um, I saw them in Omaha this past summer or yeah, I guess it would have been the beginning of this summer on their last tour, the, was it right? Or revolution radio tour. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I somehow went my whole life with never seeing green day and I grew up listening to them yep. constantly. And so when I saw them at the show, it was just like a blast from the past, you know, I'm like reliving my childhood. So I'm thinking about, you know, me and all my buddies in high school doing crazy stuff and, you know, like relationships in school and like middle school yeah. and skateboarding. <laughs> and like the first songs I ever learned on guitar were green day songs. Yeah. And then like, there's just this moment. And, uh, so Jesus of suburbia is like my all time favorite green day song. Mm-hmm. It's like 20, 16 minutes long or something oh, yeah, like that. Dude, yeah. And there just is this part when it kind of goes to that, you know, that kind of mellower part where the xylophone yeah. comes in and mm-hmm. it's like acoustic And I just like look around and it just hit me and I started tearing up, man. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, why is this happening? I'm like, I'm crying at a green day show. <laughs> like, why am <laughs> I cool. doing this? But like, there's something about just like when you attach yourself to these sounds for so long yep. and then you get in a, in a crowd of people and they all feel the same way about it. Yep. And then you see an, a, a band as seasoned as them. Like they've been doing this for over 20 years at this point. Yep. And the way that they are on stage, it's, it's like they're not even them. Like they're right. playing a role. Yeah. And it's like it's like they're a whole different person. And it's so cool to see that. Like that's like the dream I feel like as an artist is to get to that point to where when you go up there, it's like you're in a different world, but it's your world. Right. And it's such a cool just place to be. And it's, it's cool to witness, but I hope to get there someday, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. How, how do you feel when you're on stage? Like, do you feel like, are you, do you still get nervous before shows or is it, do you feel like you get in the flow, you know, and, and you're just kind of in the zone or what? Kind of, I think like the like the first show I, we ever played, I was super nervous uh, since it was my first proper show at a club. Yeah. Um, but more than anything, like I'm good, like I'm fine now. Like I mean, the most I do is stretch. I mean, yeah. I think it depends on like. I don't know. I feel like I've kind of like centered myself when I when we're playing the day of a show, and I'm like, everything's cool because I don't want to like overhype myself because I feel like if I do that then like I'm gonna get like super nervous yeah and yeah. overthink things so that's mm-hmm. why I kind of just try to stay really calm and mm-hmm. and just think about nothing and then get on the stage and play a show but like as I'm playing the show I'm also thinking so far ahead mm-hmm. because as a drummer there's like so many things you have to like well as any band member but like as a drummer personally I just really think about parts that are coming up yeah because you're like all right I'm in the second verse and the pre-chorus is a little bit different in this one so yeah. you're like yeah you do have to think ahead yeah so then do you feel like that takes you out of the moment like are you less present or or are there times when you're not thinking about what's coming next you just do it I think I think that there's sometimes where I'm both it's, in the moment because yeah. like I really don't I tend to not really look up a lot because I can't see this, the crowd anyway, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah. like I'll look at, my, you know, the bandmates sometimes and we'll smile or, you know, do something. But, um, I'm kind of just there in the moment playing my parts or then, then again, like I'll take myself out of the moment. I don't know why I just mm-hmm. kind of go in and out, but thinking of, of things coming up and, and hoping that I don't screw them up. So, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. That's cool, man. Um, okay. So we're getting towards the end and I, I want to, I guess I should have mentioned this in the beginning, but, uh, tell me about getting on 96 five. Cause that's freaking yeah. awesome. Like you guys seem to be getting a lot of radio play lately and that's, that's a really big deal. Yeah. That was really cool because how it all happened. It, it's, there's something that started at up down, which is like a beer arcade mm-hmm. in Kansas city, uh, near crossroads. And they started doing this thing. It's called local Tuesdays. Uh, Joel is the guy who runs it and they're like, you know, if you want to get on it, you know, 
shoot me a DM. So I did. Mm -hmm. Uh, He didn't get back to us like two months later, but understandable because he's trying to get this thing off the ground. So he's getting bigger bands in like the greeting committee. Yeah. And those guys. Yeah. They are freaking awesome. They're really awesome. They're so good. Love the greeting committee. Yeah. Who doesn't though? I feel like they have the most love. Yes. Like people just love them. Like they're, I've never seen a local band with a Twitter following like that. Oh, it's insane. Yeah. It's cool. Them and Hembry. Yeah, Hembry's, yeah. Hembry's, they're kind of more recent though, right? Like, are they kind of just now getting bigger or are they, they've been around for a while, yeah, right? Yeah, because they were, they were a band before Quiet, they were called Quiet Corral. Okay. And actually my friend, uh, high school guy that uh, I went to Hutch with, his name's Jesse, he was actually the lead singer of that band and like Isaac and some of the other guys were in that oh, okay. band and then when that band split, it became Hembry. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, those guys have been like on Apple commercials now for like yeah. the new speaker that they put out but uh yeah no uh the greeting committee is just awesome I yeah they stuff. are so they're blowing up and but so we finally got on uh and what jeremy does at, at the buzz for homegrown mm-hmm. she'll usually try to play the band uh that's coming in like that tuesday like she'll play because they have homegrown on 96.5 yeah. on sundays yeah and she didn't know who we were so she like dm'd us on twitter and she's like hey i'm gonna play one of your songs which is stage fright. So, and that's kind of how we all kind of just, you know, got on different radio stations. We're on actually here. We get played on kiss FM here in Lawrence. Okay. Um, 96 by the buzz, 102.7 in Kearney, Missouri, mm-hmm. our Hutch, uh, hometown station plays us. Um, I think the other alternative one Oh five one plays us every now and then. Okay. So, and then cool. I didn't know they did local stuff cause they're a newer station. Yeah, they do. They do a Sunday show as well. Awesome. Uh, and then we got played. I think actually just today, uh, ninety point one in Kansas City. Uh, All right. They're like a community radio station, and they play our stuff. Yeah. Too, so, so it seems like you guys have a very different route, uh, or like sort of. I don't know if you want to call it a business plan or, or, or goals with your band, but you guys. And you mentioned that you guys are a little bit older, so maybe you're, you know, not su- just not as interested in like hitting the road and being road dogs, like the, you know, like Sweet Ascent, and Earth yeah. Groans, and all those guys. Yeah. So like, what, uh, what, what is your, I guess, strategy behind all this? Like, is that kind of how you guys are choosing to to make the career path? Is like, let's just get radio play and play a lot of local stuff and kind of build the following here. Yeah, I think like to build within, and then also if we can, if it does happen to reach out mm-hmm. uh, because i think we we've had i've had a friend play us in la too um but yeah just probably just grow within and then push out okay I think is, is the way we're looking at it. yeah because we're like like you said we're older and mm-hmm. uh families and yeah so i think we're trying to since we're different in that way we're trying to just uh find a, a way to to do the music that way so yeah well and that's cool like uh I feel like music is changing so much that there isn't really a right or wrong way to do it anymore. So who knows? Like that could work better than tourings. I've seen a lot of bands that will tour forever and never, you know, never go anywhere. They play to empty rooms every time they play. Yep. Um, and then I see bands that, you know, never play a show and they, you know, get put on a Spotify playlist or something and they kind of start blowing up. So I, who knows, you know, who yeah. knows at this point, um, I talked to Josh Hurst from young medicine. I yeah. had him on the show once and he, they're kind of doing a similar thing too. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, their singer has a, I think red roof productions, the yeah, recording I think studio, Brett, right? Yeah. Brett. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so they're kind of doing a similar thing where they're going, they're starting out locally. Like they did a few, I think tours, but mm-hmm. they ultimately were like, we don't need to do that right. with the internet. Mm-hmm. You know, like we can, we can build quite the following just staying local yep. and so i don't know man i'm really curious to see where that goes like and it seems like now is probably the time to try that as an experiment because you do you have the internet you can yep. reach anybody mm-hmm. anywhere so i don't see why not you know just go for it even if you're not touring yeah so that's pretty cool yeah and i think that's kind of like how we approach shows too is like we kind of just I think you can be picky and choosy about what you do. And Mm -hmm. I think that's just because we have families, like there's kind of that aspect. So like, like we have a show coming up uh, in August. We're finally playing the Granada, which we're super, super stoked about. And thanks to Vigil and Thieves, they're a local band too. And they're doing an album release. So that's like my other mates have played that 
stage before. I'm the only one who hasn't. I'm like, I'm this. Everything in this band is like the first for me. Like first we're playing Jackpot, Bottleneck, and you yeah. know, Kansas City venues, and now it's the Granada. So, um, but yeah, I kind of just uh, picking and choosing the the path. I think is, and like you said, the internet, man, that's the mm-hmm. biggest thing because that that's the new media, you know, and yeah. has been for quite a while. But, um, but yeah, so I think we'll just stick with recording and then putting everything out our own because that's you know I think that's what a lot of people do and yeah which is a good thing. So yeah, yeah, definitely. So what's, what is your favorite or like biggest accomplishment that you guys have had so far? Honestly, I think it's, it, we we're still pretty jazzed about, and I can't believe we use jazz, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> that we made it onto the buzz. Cause I think all of us in the band had been listening to the buzz for so long. Yeah. And the fact that now we get played on it mm-hmm. like that, that's so cool. And like the DJs advocate for us and, um, I think that's just the coolest thing. Uh, but I think it's just, it's radio. I think mm-hmm. that's the, the coolest avenue that you can get put on radio. Yeah. So, that is cool. I mean, that may be just me, but I think the other guys can probably say that, that same thing too. So, but I mean, just in general writing and being in a band and making music and people liking it, I think that's a, a huge accomplishment in itself yeah. as well. So that's cool, man. Yeah. All right. One more. What advice would you have for, a drummer or just any musician starting out today, like for young musicians out there, if you could give them a couple tips, what would that be? Well, the, one of the biggest things that I've been thinking about lately is, um, trying to learn from a lot of people, Mm -hmm. like, cause there's so many people that their knowledge about music or an instrument. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just, I, I often ask a lot of drummers so many questions, whether if they're a beginner expert intermediate whatever like i always try to like obtain as much knowledge as possible because mm-hmm. i don't know everything yeah and i'm still trying to obtain all this knowledge about you know drums and music and all this but just listen and and also listen to like a lot of people say listen to all kinds of music that really does help true yeah um but also take time practice mm-hmm. because if you don't practice i mean there's yeah put time into it yeah if you're put in the work yeah exactly mm-hmm. because it'll get you somewhere. Yeah, for sure. So that's kind of the tips I have. Cool, dude. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you doing this, man. Thanks for having me. Um, before we get out of here though, or end this, um, where can everyone go to find all of your guys' music and you know, anything else you got going on that you want to share? Yeah. It's Spotify, um, Apple music, iTunes, uh, Pandora. We're on like all the major streaming services. Awesome. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and it's the deer. A lot, I think a lot of people think it's like an animal deer, but it's like deer, like D E A R. Yeah. And yeah. Mrs. is actually M I S S E S. Yeah. So that's what yeah. I tried. Uh, <laughs> I tried doing the voice command thing. Yeah. The deer misses, and then it just puts M R S dot. Right. Like, yeah. So yes, Mrs. Yeah. spelled out. <laughs> the deer misses. Check them out. They're a great local band. And thanks again for doing this, man. It's yeah, been I appreciate awesome. it. Yeah. All right, let's end it. Done. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the Better Ideas podcast. If you like what you heard and you want to hear more, maybe you want to contribute monetarily. If you're feeling really generous, then you can go over to patreon.com slash better ideas. That's where uh, the home bases. That's where we've uploaded everything that we've ever done or will do. And there's some extra perks for the people who decide to become patrons and, uh, you know, well-deserved because that's a pretty awesome thing to do. The next best thing would be to go to iTunes.com and leave us a five-star rating. Otherwise just, you know, follow us on Spotify or Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever. So until then, bye. Bye.